G'day, and welcome to the AHDC podcast series, Health Design on the Go. I'm your host, David Cummins, and today we're speaking to Dr. Bruno Macias, who is the president of the International Federation of Landscape Architects and has spent over 15 years teaching both undergrads and postgrads in New Zealand. Bruno is a program director of landscape architecture, deputy head of school for architecture, and director of postgrad programs. We welcome Bruno today as part of our biophilic benefits series and look forward to hearing more about some of the benefits of nature on oneself and the community. Welcome, Bruno. Thank you for your time to be here. Well, thank you, David, for the invitation. It's my pleasure to join you in the podcast today. I must admit, I didn't know there was an International Federation of Landscape Architects. Who is part of this federation and how big is the community? Oh, that's a good question. So the International Federation of Landscape Architects was established in Cambridge, England in 1946, six months after the International Union of Architects was established. So IFLA, as the acronym, is the body that represents landscape architecture globally. So we have the equivalent of about 50,000 landscape architects across 77 member associations. So it's a little bit like the United Nations model where the professional body from a country applies to become a member of IFLA and therefore all their membership automatically is part of IFLA. So we have 77 national institutes of landscape architects or national associations of landscape architects across the globe. We are organized in five geographical regions, Europe, the Americas, Asia Pacific, Africa, and the Middle East. And yeah, so we've been around for a little while. <laughs> it's very impressive. I must admit, I didn't know that, but I've been building healthcare or been in construction development for over 15 years. And the one thing I do know about landscape architecture is that it is always cut out of budget. Everyone always forgets about it. Everyone always disrespects it. Everyone always thinks we don't have the money. Let's cut that out and just paint the concrete green. And that's generally how it's been for the last 15 or so years. More recently, especially doing these podcasts, you hear more and more research come out of it. You hear more and more benefits. You hear pretty much the benefit for not only patients, community and oneself, but something that you've always known, but no one's really connected the two dots. There does seem to be this surge of research about the importance of it. So what advice would you give for people who have been building buildings in the past and are doing their designs now about the importance of landscape architecture to not only oneself, to patients and to community? What is something that you would like to make sure that is not cut out of budgets? A couple of things that are relevant here. Landscape architecture has come a long way and we are slowly moving away from that stereotype that we're all gardeners and someone needs to come and fix your backyard. From 15 years being in this profession, I haven't done a garden in my life. So here, landscape architecture is really trying to tackle all the important issues that affect our daily lives. Most of our discussions are around issues of climate change and adaptation, of health and well-being. And with the latest pandemic, the health and well-being became something of very importance because as we were deprived from being outdoors, we were locked in our houses. And most of what people missed was to be outdoors in nature and to have that sense of refuge and connection. But other things that are also important for landscape architecture, you know, the idea of food security, where are we producing and securing our food to feed our urban environments? Also, our communities, how are we engaging with ethnic diversity and different and deprived communities and making them as parts of our cities, our communities at large? And also, in particular to Australia and New Zealand, engaging with our traditional knowledge and indigenous communities. All of that became quite an important set of pillars for the profession. You are absolutely right. Landscape architecture tends to be the thing that is cut first in any project, yet it should be the first thing to be considered because if you think that all our house, houses and buildings, they're actually sitting on a landscape, so we need to understand the impact of our built environment, of our built infrastructure on that same landscape. We are reminded daily, and we just had the unfortunate set of events in New Zealand recently of massive floods. That's all the impact of planning cities without really considering our natural systems, without considering our waterways, without considering 
in public open spaces. And yet, every time there is a catastrophe, those places become very important. Those are the places where people congregate and mourn for all the bad things that happen. It's a shift in mentality that needs to happen and slowly is happening across the built environment professions to understand that we should exercise the landscape. We need to protect that asset. If we don't have it, we can't have our cities, we can't have our water to drink, we can't have our food to eat. Um, and a lot has happened over the last 20 years where countries where they have placed landscape at the forefront and they have thought about nature-based solutions. They are ahead of the game in terms of climate adaptation, sustainability issues, and stuff like that. I definitely think that landscape architecture is the profession of the 21st century, where regardless if you like it or not, any built environment professional, we need to engage with it. It's part of our daily life. We can't have cities without landscapes. And it starts all at your own backyard at home. How can I have those spaces that would actually foster my health and well-being, contributes to the sustainability and green infrastructure of cities, to then public open spaces, to then to our peri-urban and rural areas that fit into that as well. So it's a continuum of things that need to be understood and they're all interrelated. And that's primarily the difference with landscape architecture is that it's a systems thinking approach and they are all interrelated. We can't see them in isolation while some of other affiliated built environment disciplines tend to see things in isolation. We need to see them holistically. You're 100% right. There is also these benefits for staff retention, for patient care, for reducing anxiety. But how does one argue, if you want landscape architecture to be one of the number one talking points for feasibility and design, when a hospital or a space has limited space and they've got this beautiful garden out there, what logically happens most of the time is that someone sees that space and puts a building on it because they've run out of space in the building, they're over capacity, they've just got money from the government or from their investors and they need to build something to maintain their business. So knowing that space is a premium, knowing that a lot of buildings are landlocked and knowing that space is prime land, what can we do as designers to incorporate that land, but incorporate landscape architecture, knowing that there's a very high chance that land's going to go, although we could argue it shouldn't. But what can we do as designers to try and maintain landscape architecture, to maintain biophilic benefits, to hit that balance, knowing we're probably going to take that land, which I know you don't want us to take it, but we probably are. You're just hitting the nail on the head on that one. It's a compromise, isn't it? We can definitely take that land and develop it into a building of any sorts of shape and form but also we can look at that land as a potential catalyst for something else and so much research that's out there currently shows that at least 10, 20 to 30 percent of our chronic diseases can be mitigated by access to nature so having that garden outside from the door helps patients to feel better helps the healing process helps reducing the pressure on hospital beds. And there's other things we can do. We don't need only the land that's on the ground to become green or to be a sort of garden. You can look into other strategies. You can look into green walls. You can look into rooftop gardens. You can look into greenery indoors. But it's proved scientifically in many types of research so far that access to green, access to fresh air, having seen nature through the window, all of those things contribute to your health and well-being, and that reduces the taxpayer pressure on health services that tend to be overburdened quite significantly across many countries. It's a shift in perspective in terms of saying, yeah, I can add the building there and add 300,000 different hospital beds, or I can have an asset here that reduces the cost and speeds up recovery and rehabilitation. And we start seeing some examples of that in hospitals that change their approach, not only hospitals, but also prison environments where they start addressing the outdoor space of the prison cells as a way to allow rehabilitation and therapy to happen and allow inmates to be reintegrated easily into society. And we also see that a lot in hospitals coming across. So it may be not the cheapest solution, but definitely in the long term, it's probably the most profitable that we have. You've just talked about 
the benefits of connecting to nature within the hospital, but or so for patients, most hospitals will not allow fresh live plants in the hospital because of infection control, because of aspergillus, because of mold, because of whatever it may be. So how do we bring nature indoors whilst maintaining and respecting the infection control protocols of a hospital to maintain patient safety? That's a tricky one because definitely you can't bring nature into an operational theatre, for instance. It may cause more harm than actually helping anyway. We start seeing a lot of synergies between building sciences in terms of looking at proper and efficient ventilation systems, allowing nature to be contained and on display and not you know, to contaminate the entire hospital areas. We're also starting to look a lot at plants that don't have any issues with pests and that can't cause any harm to people. We start also looking a lot at materials that are more bioconscious and sustainable in their approach. So we are getting towards an area where you start seeing some results in terms of having nature indoors without posing a threat to patients. And again, it's all about the way the internal space is conceived and prototyped. If there is ways to condition access to certain areas where maybe patients at risk can't really be in certain areas while others can benefit from it. So it's that intersection between what landscape architecture knows with interior architects, with architects, with building scientists that we can really, if we work together, we can really come up with interesting design solutions that are cutting edge and don't really put anyone at harm. It was interesting you just said the nature-based solution as opposed to landscape-based solution. So when you refer to the word nature, what opportunities are there versus just plants and grass? What do you actually mean by nature that we can incorporate or bring into healthcare? Imagine like, you know, you having a sensorial experience where all your senses are activated. When you go outside and you breathe the fresh air, you touch the soil and the textures, you have a contact with water. So nature is way more than just trees or plants or shrubs. It's also having life represented at large, having water, having insects, having birds. Many of the studies that we know about the importance of nature is actually even little things like hearing birds singing outside from your window or seeing them uh, or seeing any other sort of animals. But also some people is really that activation of their senses. It's that smell of wet soil after rain that's it's so characteristic we need to bring more than just plants it's having as much access to nature and trying to mimic natural processes and ecosystems in our design so we are not only exposing people to that and the benefits of nature but also we are contributing to local ecosystems to sustainability and the resilience of our urban environments there's a lot we can do <laughs> So there's no reason we couldn't have an aquarium within a hospital which counterbalances the infection control procedures. It is generally water, but it's self-contained water, but it gives the benefit of outdoor, indoor light, but also connection to nature versus just plants, correct? Absolutely. And we know how much water is relevant and important even for thermal comfort of indoor of the buildings to maintain temperatures and stuff like that as it accumulates and releases heat. There are so many things that are just scratching the surface in terms of what potentially could be. And I think sometimes it's because our stakeholders and local councils and all the council people, they may have a limited view of what they could use. And sometimes they downgrade it that, oh, it's just about putting some plants or trees or stuff. But it's way more than that. Uh, and our ecosystems don't work in isolation normally, right? It's not only about plants. It's plants, it's the soil, it's the microbes, it's the air, it's the sun. All these kind of things are important. And again, if you're looking to biophilic solutions, that definitely is the way forward. You talked also earlier about the benefit of nature on a roof or a rooftop. So the few buildings I've done where they've tried to have some form of rooftop access have generally had rolled out very bad plastic grass, an okay view, and a few plastic plants. So I hear what they were trying to do there, but it just didn't work. How important is the difference between real plants, real grass versus plastic grass, or is something better than nothing? What would you recommend? 
I don't think the artificial stuff is gonna, ever going to be able to replace the real stuff, right? <laughs> That's an unfortunate situation. And mostly happen, uh, unfortunately, projects where there's budget cuts or there's bad planning overall. Sometimes also when buildings are conceived, Unfortunately, there are structural components that are not taken into consideration early on to allow the weight of having a rooftop garden. There is extra issues of structural components. And sometimes it's also a decision there's no budget to invest in such things. But I don't think you have the same benefits. Rooftop gardens are generally used as thermal comfort for buildings to rely less on heating and cooling because they maintain a more stable temperature throughout the year. And of course, you have all the floor and the fauna that can interact with your rooftop garden. You can produce food. There's many examples of that being used in schools where they pretty much cater the entire local canteens with the food they produce in the rooftops. And that's the strategy for cities that are very dense, that don't have room for outdoor spaces, where that's used quite heavily as well. So I don't think it's the same thing having a replacement artificial grass rather than having the real deal. <laughs> yeah, I just had to ask the question because some people are saying it's better than nothing, but I'm not 100% convinced. There are some studies that shows you that having something that's green is soothing and healing in itself. So I'm definitely sure that having something, even if it's not real, it's better than having nothing. I agree with that, but I don't think it's the same as having a real ecosystem functioning in your rooftop. <laughs> Um, I do want to ask a question just before we go. I've seen some examples overseas, but I've never in Australia, but you might have, the plant walls or green walls inside car parks where they can help absorb carbon monoxide and actually have a quite controlled and quite oxygen-rich environment. Have you seen any such examples in New Zealand or Australia where the whole car park basically is a green wall and what type of plants are they and what can we do to try and incorporate that and why doesn't it happen more often? No, unfortunately, I haven't seen many examples either in Australia or New Zealand. I'm aware of some overseas. They tend to be plants that have a very high tolerance to pollutants, especially to carbon monoxide and nitrogens and all that kind of things. They also are plants that don't really need a heavy maintenance because that's also the issue at times in some of the projects is when we don't really count that there's costs associated with maintenance. It's a brilliant strategy. As you mentioned, if, if we can have something green that soaks in all the carbon monoxide, it's a great way to engage with green walls. We need more of that. There is many examples of countries looking into more green wall solutions, even as a way for carbon sequestration overall to address some of our targets globally and locally on carbon carbon emissions. In a climate such as Australia, it's a brilliant solution because there is not the extreme situation of having frost in winter and snow. Even here in New Zealand will be a great solution. I'm aware of a project here in New Zealand where we are using a lot of green walls in university spaces as a way to purify air and indoor air and circulation of air overall across buildings, especially here in Wellington. And it's something that's been more an experimental side of things, trying to understand which plants will tolerate such extreme environments. And because they are in a way, maybe they are more deprived from daylight or things like that. There's a heap of stuff happening out there that I wish I would have time to know all about it. There's very cool things happening that are involving plants in nature, and hopefully we'll see more of those coming. <laughs> Just before I go, knowing there's a lot of architects and designers and builders all very interested in this space, hence our series, like, what would you like people to start pushing for or you know fighting for in the world of biophilic design? What's a take-home message that architects can use to help encourage people to understand the benefits of this more and to fight for it to be part of our future hospitals? Well, I primarily like that nature is not an afterthought, but should be something that should be embraced since the beginning in any project we conceive. And we just talk now here through this podcast. It's about that continuum of conceiving spaces from indoors to the building to the outdoors and see that they're all interlinked together. And having nature at the forefront, it really may be an increase in the budget or a higher investment up front, but the long-term benefit is crucial, not only for those that use those buildings, but for the entire community and for our cities. So they are part of a, a wider green and blue infrastructure that come together and the benefits of it are huge. We don't need to go far back 
And if we all reflect on our experience of COVID and seeing how important it was for most of people to actually be outdoors and breathe the fresh air and bring nature and hug a tree, all those things were crucial. We can't just have cities that are concrete jungles. It's not sustainable and it deeply affects our health and well-being. We should be putting nature and landscape as the first priority in anything we do. And councils should be forcing any new developments to have a certain percentage of greenery involved in their projects, either through green laws, green roofs, outdoor pocket parks, whatever is going to be, but that should be part of any development. Yeah, it's a really good point. I personally can't wait to argue to get more greenery in my hospitals because it's such an important idea. And I just want to say thank you so much for all the hard work you put into this sector of architecture and into the world of design. It's people like you who are literally pushing the way forward to get more green spaces, to give all those benefits to staff and to patients as well. Congratulations again on being the president of the International Federation of Landscape Architects, which has been around since the 60s, which I didn't know about, but I'm almost positive you'll be there for a little bit longer and you and your organization and the Federation as well, because I think it's an absolute benefit that we all have to embrace for future health. So thank you very much. Oh, no, thank you, David, for inviting me. It's a pleasure. It was great to chat with you. You have been listening to the Australian Health Design Council podcast series, Health Design on the Go. If you'd like to learn more about the AHDC, please connect with us on our website or LinkedIn. Thank you for listening.